So, data. To start off with, I'm going to ask you guys a quick question. What is the most basic form of data? So anyone, it's just a question. What do you think? How would you answer this question? Table. Hmm? Table. Table. Yeah. Table. What do you mean by a table? So like you have, you have all kinds of data that exist on the on the table, and then you know what's the uh, catalog. Of yeah. I mean that's the the format that most of our data nowadays, especially in GIS, comes in the form of table. Mm -hmm. If you can break it down even farther than that, what is the data within the table? How is it uh, composed? What is it made up of? Numbers, right? Are there any ideas? Coded information. Coded information, good. Can you break it down even more? What, what kind of code? I know. <laughs> Very good. That is actually 100% correct. Binary code is the most basic form of data. Basically, yes or no. If you, that's really, at the end of the day, everything in the universe is composed of yes or no, right? So, you've all seen Disney's Mulan, right? Anyone has not seen Disney's Mulan? Good. <laughs> the very first scene of Disney's Mulan, uh, there is a scene where the Huns are attacking China, and when that happens, they start to light the flame on the Great Wall of China, and then one by one, this uh, the entire wall up begins to light up. And basically what this is, is a digital signal being transmitted across geographies. So in my opinion, this could be seen as a GIS, a geographic information system. Essentially what is being done here is a digital signal uh, that's being composed in binary, yes or no. Basically, if the fire is off, no Huns are attacking. If the fire is on, Huns are attacking. And so because of this, uh, Beijing knew that the Huns were attacking and they had to assemble an army to stop the Huns from invading China. So binary um, is a form of a digital signal. A digital signal is basically composed in steps. You can actually measure it in increments. That's different from what's known as an analog symbol, which is continuous. The way I like to describe it is, think of analog, well, you know, drawing digitally on a computer, versus drawing by hand analog. Analog is continuous data. It has an infinite number of increments in between, whereas digital, it is purely uh, segmented into these intervals together. So what was being transmitted across the Great Road of China was a digital signal, as opposed to an analog signal, which might be, say, a person riding a horse traveling across the Great Plains and delivering a message. So binary is what's known as base two. Uh, but as an aside, do you guys know why we use base 10 by chance? Good. Are you like a computer genius, a computer science guy? No, I want to be. No. The reason why we use base 10 is completely arbitrary. It's a, just a random coincidence, the fact that we have 10 fingers, right? If we had 14 fingers, we'd be counting in base 14. If we'd be counting in if we had uh, 16 fingers. So this is what's going to make when we communicate with aliens with their 16 fingers and 100 tentacles, really confusing is because they're going to be counting and doing math in a completely different system from us. So, uh, but that is really the arbitrary reason why we count in base 10, because of this. Um, so when you take data, binary data, and you combine it together, you create what's known as an algorithm, um, essentially a recipe. And you guys know what algorithm, algorithms are. Um, it's basically a basically a grasshopper script, right? A recipe, step A, step B, step C, step D. Using an algorithm, you essentially create a computer program, and that computer program stores data uh, using, and, using AND or OR gates. So uh, every piece of logic in the world can be stored in AND slash OR gates. What I mean by that? Well, for instance, uh, Something can be true if it's A or B. So if A is true, then if A is true, then the whole uh, uh, situation is true. If B is true, then the whole situation is true. If both A and B are true, then the whole situation is true. If A but not B is the uh, uh, situation, then that is true. Basically, these are the way logic is stored uh, in the, within a computer program. Um, another way, just 
because I like memes. I don't know if you guys like memes at all, but <laughs> honey and badger is honey badger. Honey, not badger, it's honey. Honey or badger is something, something in between that. And so if you use Grasshopper, you know the result of that is what's known as a Boolean. True, false, true, false, true, false, or 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1, which is essentially a binary code. So data is basically an electrical current streaming through AND and OR gates. So that's what you guys are using right now in computers, where basically the data that you input is being streamed electronically through AND and OR gates to create GIS. Now, uh, before you guys had computers in the 70s, this is how data was mapped and stored using these little punch cards. Um, you guys, have you ever seen like these things before? Okay, so you are, you're totally into this whole computer science. Uh, uh, but yeah, basically what this is essentially is a bunch of and or gates for yes or no's. So when the punch is uh, hollow, then that means it stores a certain piece of data, and then when all this combines together, it creates an algorithm that stores a map, essentially. So there is this crazy, I'll send you a link after the class of this crazy uh, documentary of how maps were actually stored in the 70s. They didn't have computers uh, like we have now. They had like, uh, these huge, huge machines that stored tons of maps on these cards. It's actually kind of nuts. Uh, and kind of crazy to think that nowadays it's much easier uh, how we store data. So again, you guys know this as Grasshopper now. Uh, the way that you create algorithms and the way you compose programs to process data. So, you know, really that, that was like computation and data in a really, really brief, uh, brief set of slides. Um, but, you know, data and computation, that's all great, it's all fun. Uh, but the reality is that decisions especially in our industry, planning and design, we don't make decisions based just off data. Uh, we need stories. And so this is, this is a concept that was heavily emphasized at a bunch of the mapping conferences that I went to in the past year. Basically, everyone said, data is fine, data is fine, but you need a story. You need something to talk about. You need some kind of human element to the data. Otherwise, no one is going to have a, an emotional reaction to your work. As an example, uh, this here is a little map that I made, and as you can see, I used a black background, which is my number one rule that you don't use like black backgrounds. But this is my this is the first drawing I ever made at Harvard. Um, so at Harvard, we had our initial uh, workshop and we learned GIS, and uh, they asked us to create a map about certain aspects of a site. In this case, the site was Cape Cod in Massachusetts. So this is the whole Cape Cod area. And what I did was and. The, my point here is that this is a bad map. This is a bad map. Um, but my, what I did was I said, okay, I'm just going to throw as much data as I can on this map. Just throw it on the, on, the, on the board. Not really care about what is being shown. Just kind of throw it on the wall because that's what I thought Harvard people liked. They just like information and data. They, they wanted to look smart. And when I presented this at the review, I was completely ripped to shreds by my professors, especially this lady here, <laughs> Kelly Shannon. She is a uh, landscape architect, um, I believe she's right now dean of, I can't remember which college, uh, she's a dean of the landscape program in one of the colleges, I can't remember, but uh, you know, when she saw my, my drawing, she just said like, you guys are designers, stop, act, stop acting like horrible planners, and she was so disgusted by what I made here, because it had no human element to it, it had no uh, emotional element to it, it was just pure data, and really what I learned from this experience is that maps that just show data really do nothing for you guys at all. Data means nothing. Really what we are doing, are we are designing stories and we're creating stories. So we gotta bring our information back to the human level uh, as much as we can. And this is like my little cartoon of her because I do cartoons. So uh, I wanna show one example of what I think uh, a good story map uh, is, and that's the Menard map. Um, now, in the world of cartography, this is actually considered by many to be one of the greatest maps of all time. In fact, some people might say this is the best map of all time. Um, essentially, what this is showing is it's, the map itself is pure data, so by itself, you're just looking at numbers. Um, but basically, what this is, is mapping is Napoleon's campaign to invade Russia in 1812. And so, this is when they started. And what happened was, uh, this was one of the greatest military disasters of all time. Basically, 
Napoleon's massive army, they basically walked across the <laughs> continent of Europe, and as they walked, things like weather, things like disease, things like uh, uh, sickness, they all began to deplete the army as they trekked across uh, Europe. And by the time they reached Russia, almost the entire army uh, was des decimated by that point. And even when they, when, when they got to Russia, uh, there was really nothing there for them to, to conquer. And so what ended up happening is they retreated, so the uh, beige color is the uh, invasion, and then the black color is the retreat. And as you can see, this whole conquest, which basically led to nothing, uh, was really just a huge military disaster because all it, meant, all it ended up being was a huge loss of human life. So the, the map by itself is the information, but what really makes it interesting is the story behind it. And so you see, uh, this is why you don't make, you don't walk across Europe in the middle of the bad weather to invade countries because what ends up happening is nothing gets accomplished. And of course, uh, I think the most, right now, probably the most interesting story uh, right now is the story of uh, our most recent United States election. Um, I assume since a lot of you guys are Chinese and from Asia, you, have, you didn't vote in the election, so, but I assume you followed it. Um, but this is one of, the, one of the craziest stories of all time right now in terms of the geography of the United States because uh, pretty much Pretty much everyone and every analyst leading up to it thought uh, Clinton had it, but a lot of things surprised us. And so what we're going to do today is we're going to take a look at some of this data and kind of kind of unpack in our heads. I'm not going to pretend like I'm an expert in this kind of election topic, but kind of unpack in our heads uh, what can we learn from the map about how elections work in the United States. And so again, this image, you know, Donald Trump, you know, glad we hear the election results. <laughs> so with that, I'm going to lead to the description of our first assignment, and then from there I'm going to move into the tutorial. Um, so the first assignment, and I saved this, uh, this document in the box order, so you can examine it in more detail later, um, is what I'm calling a story map. Um, right now I have it as October 5th as the review day. I know some students yet last class mentioned that that day might not work. And so I just need to clarify who is, yes. I will be out of town. Okay, so a lot of you are out of town and not working. Okay, so, okay, so I will change it to the week after. Does that work better, October 12th? Yeah. Okay. So I'll move this, I'll, I'll update this sheet uh, before I, or, and I reset it to the box. Basically October 12th, so we got a lot of time to work on this. Um, it's gonna be one drawing, so pretty easy way to start. Um, I'm making it a 36 by 48 size board. Um, I'm trying to go, I'm gonna go big this, this year. In the past I've gone like 34 or 36 by 24 sheets and I've always felt like they could be bigger. So we're gonna go big this year. I'm, I'm, I'm kind of experimenting here. I'm kind of seeing how this would, lead, what kind of drawings this would lead to. So is there any issue with doing a 36 by 48 uh, plot? Okay. Um, and if you view location, I'll figure out what, where it's gonna be depending on who I can invite to review. Last year I brought my students to my office to do the review. Uh, I don't know who, what's gonna happen this year, but we'll figure it out later. So um, I'll just quickly read the description. Uh, when it comes to map making, uh, story is everything. Your jobs as designers isn't simply to show data, but to curate and narrate the real world stories that is supported by the data. So for this project, you are open to choose any top of, topic of research that interests you, but you have to make it important and you have to make it meaningful to you. A map with an indifferent attitude serves no purpose. So. Um, Kind of explain what I mean here. You know, in the past, a lot of students have picked really crazy topics. I showed you guys a UFO map, for example. I showed you guys, um, I didn't show you another example, but there are examples of, like, I, on the bird bomb, salmon fishing, Asian youth culture. Uh, some, one student was interested in hydrology of the Mississippi River, so he researched CSOs um, on the Mississippi. One student did a really great project on nuclear waste in Japan. Um, so you can really research any topic 
But the important thing is that it's interesting to you. Um, I want you to have fun with this project. I don't want you just to make a map just for my class. I want you to think about what really, what kind of designer you want to be. Uh, how can you take this class and make it meaningful to your career in the future? So really pick a topic that you think you want to talk about. If I were taking this class, like I would probably make a map of cute animals in the United States or something like that. And you can go for that if you want. Um, again, it really, it's just the point here is to have fun with it and not to really overthink it. So you can read the rest of this, but uh, it's supposed to be data driven. So you have to find data to support it and then uh, support that with uh, graphs, uh, uh, symbology, that kind of stuff. And I'll show you some techniques today and next few weeks on how to make it look good. Um, so let me go to the next page. So 36 by 48, some graphic requirements, all this stuff you know, scale bar, North Arrow, legend, uh, text descriptions. You need to sort uh, source your data. So you can't just put the data in, not tell me where it came from. You gotta tell me where it came from. So it's just like literally the, the URL of where it came from and obviously labeling annotation. No black backgrounds, because um, please stop wasting ink. And, uh, and then the grading is gonna be 20% of your final grade. So you can kind of read this here. Uh, food for thought, these are some important things I want you to consider. Um, the first one is, please avoid choosing really heavy, dark topics. And in the past, every time I've done this class, the past three years, you know, there's always students who did stuff about drug use, crime, violence, uh, all, the, all these real segregation, all these topics that are really hard to talk about. Now, if you want to research these topics, you can. But what I've found is that, and I'm, I'm just kind of, I'm just going to say this, a lot of the Asian students and the Chinese students don't really, don't live here, and they don't really understand the social, like, uh, really what it means to, what these issues mean. So they research the data and they kind of talk about it in a very objective manner, um, but they don't really know it that well. So what I've found is that it, it, these maps are more academic than personal, and I don't want that. I want these maps to be personal for you. So think about what topics make the most sense. And if it means like doing research for you know your hometown in China or something like that, then that makes more sense than to talk about you know crime in St. Louis when you've only lived here for a year, right? So again, you can you can choose these topics if you want, but I would recommend uh, not going there. And also the the second thing is if you choose more fun topics, I can I get to invite more fun people to our reviews as opposed to trying to find professors from the social work school or finding professors you know, who really know about this stuff. Because like, if you pick hard topics, I gotta find people who really know about these topics to respond to your work. Any questions about that particular point? Or are you all game about what we're doing here? Oh, we get to talk about our selected topics with you? Yes, you can, and so like, <laughs> you don't have to wait until the very, uh, uh, the review to, to talk to me about this project. I would say, please, like, talk to me if you have ideas. You want to threaten me? I can help you. I can help you find it. I can help you uh, make make this project work for you. What I don't want you to do is, um, you know, pick a topic um, that you kind of you don't really have a strong opinion on, and then move forward with it. I've had students in the past who have done that. They kind of picked a topic that they were kind of like on the fence about. But I just said, I, I gave them really bad advice and I said, I said, go for it. And what happened is that they suffered for that. Like really the, the project became more of a burden on them as opposed to a fun project. Um, this has to be fun to you guys. I don't want you guys to come to this class and just think, oh, I, I gotta make a map for Frank's class. And that leads to the last topic. I mentioned this last class, you don't work for me. I work for you. So never just make what I, you think that I want. Um, I, again, I've had this experience. I'm going to try to really emphasize this point this semester is that, you know, don't listen to me. Whatever you do, don't listen to me. In the past, I've given the students really bad advice, and they've made bad projects as a result of that. Uh, I'm here just to guide you. I can give you advice, but you can choose to take it or not. Really, you got to decide how you want um, your projects to move forward. That's another thing that I am considering not doing this year. In the past, I've always shown examples of previous student work. Um, this year I'm thinking about not showing examples because I kind of want to see where you guys end up on a fresh slate. I know that's kind of that's kind of difficult, but I again I'm I'm still kind of new to teaching. This is only like my fourth year teaching at WashU, 
And I'm really experimenting in a lot of different ways to see how, what kind of results do I get from my students if I show, give them certain pieces of info and I don't give them certain pieces of info. So this year I'm not going to show you examples unless you guys really, really, really want it. Um, who, who really, really, really wants examples? Good. All right. <laughs> All right. And also because like, if I show you guys examples, you kind of have a, in your brain a standard, like, oh, it only needs to be that good for me to get an A. And I don't want you guys to know that. I want you guys to make this map like the best possible map that you uh, possibly can make. So uh, let me pause.